Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, from here in Saddleworth, England. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're continuing on in our, our study of the Sermon on the Mount, finding out what normal Christianity should look like, so we know where the deviations are. Amen. Because <clears throat> indeed, we want to be in line with the Word of God. So, yeah, we're, we're picking up where we left off last time. The last verse we studied in Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, was Jesus saying to us that we are to be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. So now we're going to pick up today in uh, chapter 6, verse 1, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about practicing our righteousness. Hallelujah. Mm. Now, you know, I, I've said a number of times in this study, and many times, as a matter of fact, that the Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, and said that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. And one of the things he says it is profitable for is training in righteousness. So it truly is important that we know how to practice that righteousness. So, Father, I ask that you would open the eyes of our heart, that we might see wonderful things from your Word in our time together today. Lord, that, that we would be what you desire us to be as you are at work, both the work and the will of your good pleasure in our lives, Lord God. Use this time, Lord. Use this time to draw us closer to you, to give us greater understanding of your purpose in our lives, Lord God. So we praise you and thank you that you have sent to us the spirit of truth to lead us into all truth. And that spirit dwells within us, Father. So in the name of your Son, Jesus, we just give you thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. All right. As I said, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. I'll read the first four verses. And I'm reading from the New American Standards, just so you know, okay? Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. They do that in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Hallelujah. Practicing your righteousness. There's a bit of a, a, a thing I think we need to deal with right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, the, the Apostle Paul, after writing in Philippians about all that he had been in his past as a Pharisee and all that he had given to gain Christ, goes on in that letter to say that he had no righteousness of his own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, Philippians 3.9. You see, our, our righteousness... Our right relationship with the Father is indeed the work of Jesus Christ in our lives that was accomplished and completed by the sacri His sacrifice on the cross. Amen. Yes. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians and say, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You see, we who have accepted that free gift of God are righteous. The Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 You see, Paul makes it so clear in the, like in the third chapter of, Roman, of his letter to the Romans that righteous, the righteousness that we have, our justification, is by faith, Apart from works, we do not have to work for our righteousness. So why did the Lord say, speaking to the saved, his disciples, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
That's what he said in the very, you know, in the beginning of this, in the Beatitudes. All right. Like faith, which does not come by works, but then demands that it bear the fruit of works. That's as James wrote. He said, even so faith that has no works is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. James 2, 17 and 18. You see, righteousness, as Paul wrote, must bear fruit. Right. He said to the Philippians, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve of the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You see, after Jesus' last statement that I mentioned, you know, that, that we're to be perfect even as our Heavenly Father is perfect, it seemed imperative that we know why we are to be perfect. Since pride is always seeking opportunity in our lives, and the danger is that we might think that this is all about us. All right? The work that the Lord has done and is doing in us has one primary purpose, to glorify the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The righteousness that we have and the perfection that he is causing in us was purchased by his blood shed upon the cross and must point to God and not to us. Amen. All right? Yes. That said, we are indeed to practice our righteousness. Now, you know, in, in the King James, the authorized version, it says to talk about do, and then do, you know, acts of giving alms. And it's about doing. Mm -hmm. There comes a, a point in time that it has to bear fruit. You know, the, the, like it's the faith the that we have has to lead yeah. to obedience. Mm -hmm. the, the righteousness we have has to lead to action. All right. So. Jesus said here earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Mm -hmm. So they are. People, the world should see the work that we do, but we shouldn't get the credit for it. It's always about It's got to be glorifying, glorifying the Father. God. Because our own righteous deeds, the prophet Isaiah said, yes. are like filthy rags. It's in Isaiah 64, verse 6. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we proclaim him. Paul said to the Colossians in chapter 1. We proclaim him. You know, uh, that it's a great song, which I can't sing, yes. that, that Peter wrote in the first letter. We are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? To show forth the excellencies of him, to proclaim the praises, the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into our marvelous light. It's it always, like. always, did I say ever? Yeah. I did? Yeah. Thank God for a suitable helpmate. Okay. It's, it's always about pointing to the Father, to, the, yeah. or to Jesus. Because even to the end, even to the end, because in Revelation 15 it says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. Mm -hmm. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Revelation 15, 2 and 3, it's always about who receives the glory. And if you think that's... Uh, not an important thing. I want to read you a couple of verses. The first from Exodus 34. Exodus 34, 14. For you shall not worship any other God. For Yahweh, the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And in Isaiah, God spoke to him to say, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. God will not share his glory. It's about him. It's about his works. We are the works of his hands. Amen. We are the work of his hands. Yes. So it, all the glory has to go to him. You know, Stephen, as he was 
facing the council and the high priest, and just prior to being stoned to death for what he was about to say, said this, Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Acts 7, 39 and 41. When they made, right? If we fail to understand that what should have been the fruit of our righteousness will be, if we don't understand that, the, what should be the fruit of our righteousness will become about the work of our hands, and that will be the fruit of lawlessness. Just like that abominable golden calf. Yes. All right? It's certainly true, as the Lord makes clear at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that a person can do the good works. You can do these things and still be practicing lawlessness rather than righteousness. That's why Jesus said in the seventh chapter, the, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Mm -hmm. You're either going to practice lawlessness or you're going to practice righteousness. Yes. The key here, of course, is pride. Mm -hmm. The insidious sin that would transfer the glory from the Lord to ourselves. We always have a choice. It is always a choice. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you know, here, and we'll get into this soon in this in this segment probably not today because one of the things we're going to look at as is as a fruit of our righteousness is knowing how to pray in our prayer life yes. and when jesus taught us the model for prayer mm -hmm. he ended by saying speaking of the father right it's addressed to our oh, father, father. Yes. for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen matthew six thirteen. The glory belongs to Him. Okay? We have to recognize that immediately. That has to become our life and our lifestyle. It has, that has to be the truth that abides in our heart, yes. that moves everything that we do. <clears throat> the gateway to sin, the trickle down, mm -hmm. starts with haughty eyes. Yes. Pride, mm -hmm. right? It says in Proverbs chapter 6, there are six things, yea, even seven, which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to Him. And the first one is haughty eyes. That's pride. Yes. So then, after this statement, Jesus goes on to, to deal with the things that practicing righteousness should consist of. Mm -hmm. Following on in, in Matthew chapter 6. Right. Giving to the poor, praying, forgiveness, fasting, and serving the Master. So we'll start with the first one. We're going to look at this. Giving to the poor. So I'm going to read again. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 2 through 4. Before you go on, okay. I just wanted to mention that this is never, well, I shouldn't say never, but almost never, preached in the church about when, when they talk about giving, it's always giving as tithes, but never giving yeah, well, alms to the poor. That, you know, that really is an incredibly important topic. And one that is worthy of a, a whole look. Because one of the things that happened early in the church, where Alice is saying, you know, if you look at Acts chapter 2, it talks about how the, the body of Christ, the saints of God, the redeemed, those who had accepted, the disciples of Christ who had accepted his saving work. They were of one mind. There was unity in that yes, body. Yes, yes. Nobody considered anything to be his own, right? Mm-hmm. And it says if they saw somebody in need, they would take care of that. Right. Well, you go a couple of chapters ahead to Acts chapter 4, and still they're of one mind, and there is unity in the body, but it says when they, what they would do is they would bring from their abundance and put it at the feet of the apostles. So rather than them dealing with it directly, now all of a sudden it's going through the organization of the, of the church. Right. 
That's where it's and I, I, you know, I can't honestly tell you if I think that's, it doesn't matter what I think, honestly, but whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But you can see this transition Shift. taking place yeah. that goes on to Acts chapter 6 when the, the church truly begins to get organized. Right. It becomes an organization. Institution. So, but here <clears throat> Jesus is saying, speaking to all of us, right. all of us, that when you give to the poor, now, you know, he didn't say if you give to the no, poor. No. He, says when. he said when you give to the poor. You see, because he has just instructed his followers, all of his followers, to give to those who ask and to love That's not right. only those who love you or those who you approve of, but to all. And of course, we can clearly see that the fruit of love is giving. giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. So that whoever so believe, that's, that gift is the gift that gives us life now. That was the fruit of his love, was the gift of his son Christ Jesus. The gift of salvation. The gift of eternal life. So how much we are to give is expressed by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians. When he writes, now you may want to turn this part off, I don't know. <laughs> he said, have this attitude, have the same mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2. That's verses 5 to 8. I, I think I've shared with you before, but I, it's worth sharing again. I was, Alice and I were over in Lyon, France, in, a few years back, and I was at a, a house group teaching a Bible study with all of these Africans mm -hmm. who had come from Africa to France to try and find employment so they'd be able to send money back to their families so their families wouldn't starve to death. I mean, they came there out of, out of desperate need. And they didn't come to an easy place or an easy life in France. I mean, as immigrants, legal immigrants, they did not come to an easy place. They, it was difficult to find employment, and it was hard work, and they didn't get paid a lot. But at one point in the Bible study, and I don't know what, what aroused this or brought this to be, one of the fellows asked me, he said, why doesn't the church in America do more to help us? And it just popped out of my mouth. I said, because we don't care. Now, it may sound harsh, but that's... I guess that's, it came out of me. And I stopped and I repented because I did, I was too quick to speak or to be slow to speak, quick to listen. So I said, no, let me, let me change that a little bit. I said, it's because we don't care enough. And that's the truth. Amen. Amen. So that night when Alice and I went back to this little place where we were staying, it was just on my heart to pray and ask the Lord, you okay, how much is enough? How much is enough? And he led me to this very verse in Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Jesus, the example, the one that we're supposed to have the same mind as, the same attitude, he emptied himself. And the Lord said to me, you've given enough when you have emptied yourself. Now I'm going to tell you another truth here. When you empty yourself, he will keep pouring back into you. You'll, when you when you are willing to give all, you will never have given all because he will keep filling you. Right. And you won't be stagnant then. As but as but remember that. Yeah. Okay? Jesus emptied himself. He gave all. Giving to the poor is practicing our righteousness. It's a fruit of our righteousness, which was a gift to us from God. Mm -hmm. It's one gift leading to another gift. You see, now th this may very well, the con we go through, we've been doing this study of the Sermon on the Mount for weeks and weeks and weeks and maybe months. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It could go on for years as far as I can, am concerned. But remember, this took place in a very short, r relatively short period of time. So sometimes we kind of get disconnected, right? He's saying, you know, we're to give, when we give to the poor, but he started this entire Sermon on the Mount with a statement that's connected to this. And that was, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3. You see, 
we have previously looked at the fact that it all belongs to the Lord, whatever it is. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, all that it contains, the fullness thereof, it's all the Lord's. You know, we say, okay, he owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. Why not? He owns every cattle on any hill. It's all his, the fullness of it, okay? You have to understand that anything that we possess to give, we only have stewardship over because it has been entrusted to us by the owner, God. Let me, let me give you an example. If somebody gave you a check, okay? Somebody writes you a nice, generous check, and you take it to the bank to cash it, the bank teller cannot boast of his or her generosity when they hand you the cash. They'd only been entrusted with what belonged to another, and that other had instructed them to give it to you. If that teller was to take credit for the money just given to you, they would have then been acting as if it were money that they had handed over, mm -hmm. that belonged to them. And acting is the key word there, because that's exactly what an actor does. He pretends to be somebody or something that they are not. Thus, Christ's statement about the hypocrites. The word hypocrite literally comes from the Greek word, which means an actor. Okay? When, not if, you give, it is not you who are giving, but the Lord who dwells and works within you. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Colossians 3.3. 3. You know, we're moved by the Spirit of God. It's God who is doing the work in you. So it's God who's giving the gift. That's why you can't take credit for it. You're no more than like the bank teller. You're passing along something that's been entrusted to you that belongs to somebody else at the instruction of the person that it belongs to. The person, the God, the Almighty. Hallelujah. <laughs> So, if you're not giving to be seen by men, then you will not care. In fact, you'll rejoice that only your Heavenly Father has seen what you've done. That's right. Okay? Because if you seek the approval of men, you will have received your reward in full. Paul said that. If, he said, if, I'm, if I'm still seeking the approval of men rather than the approval of God, I cannot be a bondservant of God. All right? So, whatever you, let me say that again. Whatever you give, you have received. Now, Paul makes that perfectly clear, and he explains the ministry that he and the other apostles and Apollos had. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to, well, I'll, I'll let you know. It says, let a man regard us in this manner, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? He proclaimed that he, Apollos, and the others were servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Think about ownership, stewardship, and possession. God entrusted and gave dominion to Adam over the earth, but it still belonged to him. He gave him stewardship and he gave him possession but God retained the ownership. Now, that should be a blessing to us, because remember what Jesus said. He said, he talked about the, that enemy, the adversary, who comes as a, a thief, you know, to steal and kill and destroy, but he said that I come that they may have life and have it abundantly, John 10.10. 10. He has given each of us a gift, and he has given us an abundance of that gift, whatever it is, for the common good. Think about what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There's a lot of bad teaching on abundance, mm. that it's all for you. No, that's not the way it works. That's not His way. That way, his ways, which is higher than ours, is this. At the present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Amen. All right? Amen. God, he, you know, 
Okay, let me tell you my theology, and I probably shared this before. Yes. But again, it won't hurt to do it again. It won't hurt me. It won't hurt you to listen. <laughs> I believe in the promises of God. I trust in the Word. I live by the Word. May it be. My God shall supply all of my needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in Philippians 4.19. Yes, it does. That said, when He gives and supplies my need... He is likely, even more likely, to give what I need to somebody else. Right. What? Someone whom he would rightfully expect to heed his word. And his word says this in 1 John chapter 3. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. God will give the thing I need to somebody else, that somebody else who loves me, who loves the word, will see my need and supply out of his abundance. And we both get blessed. Amen. The giver, more, more than me, because remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Mm. It should be our great desire to give because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And the love of God is giving. Yes. Alice said something that's true. You can hear a lot of teaching on tithing. You don't hear a lot of teaching on giving to the poor, on giving alms. I grew up in New York City, and I'm going to tell you something. One of the first things I learned, being a streetwise guy growing up in New York City, was how to avoid the panhandlers. Mm -hmm. How to avoid the beggars. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. That's, that's the way it was. So now, all of a sudden, the love of God is put in your heart, and we're supposed to be giving out of our abundance. And yes, you do have abundance. You have abundance of something. If you don't have a dollar bill or a pound to give or a shilling to give somebody, give them the love of God. But give yeah. them something. Yes. Because you have an abundance of something. Hallelujah. Let the love of God lead you to practice your righteousness by giving. Again, it's not you're not earning anything. Yes, you're, God's going to give you a reward for your faithfulness to Him. But don't do it for the reward. Mm -hmm. Do it for the glory of God. Thank Let everything in your life be, be for the glory of God. Yeah. That people would see your good works. And that they would glorify your Father in heaven for that deed. Hallelujah. Well, tempest fugit, as they say in old Rome. Time, time flies. flies. So here we are. And I can tell you one thing about the time we've just spent. We are now about a half an hour closer to the coming of Jesus Christ than we were when we started. <laughs> so that's time well spent. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Please pray about what we've talked about. Father, yes. that you would make it more and more real, that it would be your spirit that dwells within us, that would make this come alive in our lives, Lord God, and it would make it become the life that was in us, that is in us, Lord God, that you would be glorified. We praise you and thank you for your word especially your word made flesh for your son, Jesus Christ. Until next time, well, may the Lord bless you and may you be used by him for the glory of his name. Bye-bye until next time.